guys, let's get started. Uh, today we have another event and our guest speaker is our very own professor, Dr. Jenny Lobbins. Well, her area of specialization is Jewish studies and her research focuses on ancient Jewish literature and religion. Her first book, Socratic Torah, Non-Jews in Rabbinic Intellectual Culture, examines late antique rabbinic literature's attitudes and discourse about non-Jews. Her current research project is on rabbinic eschatology and addresses why and how the rabbis of the Talmud talked about the end of the world. Dr. Lobbins studied at Bernard College, Hebrew University, and the Jewish Theological Seminary and has taught at various colleges in New York and New Jersey. Dr. Lobbins currently teaches survey of the world's religions, Hebrew, Bible, and Judaism. And I'm sure next semester you yes. will have a chance to enroll in one of her fascinating courses. Okay, guys, let's welcome Dr. Jenny Lobbins. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Lobbins. It's very nice to... Uh, I uh, get to do this talk. Oh, look. Okay. So you've all been studying about uh, migration. So you know that geography and location affect almost uh, every aspect of an individual's life and society's uh, experience. And that can happen consciously and unconsciously. There are innumerable versions of how that plays out. So I'm a religious studies professor. So I think, first of all, about how does migration affect uh, religion? Uh, and Judaism presents, we're going to talk about Judaism today, uh, it presents both a uh, unique story and in some ways a very common story. So here's the broad point. I'll come back to this again at the end and throughout. The consequences and the implications of migration intersect dramatically with the interests of religion. So let's pause for a minute to talk, talk about the interests of religion and what that means. I feel like I'm really far away from you guys because I'm sat in the front row. Jokes on you. I, oh. ah, sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so those of you who've already taken your religious studies um, requirement, I hope are not new to the idea that religion isn't just about faith in God or following the rules of a church or another religious authority. Religion can be a lens um, and a filter through which to experience and understand um, both personal and communal life. Religion is both prescriptive, it tells you what to do, right? Um, it guides people how to live your life, but also responsive to the realities that uh, people experience. This may all be a bit more vague than is useful, uh, but I'll go through some, uh, some details, and for the rest, you should take some more religious studies classes. So we'll go through four, specifics, uh, four specific aspects of migration in the context of Judaism. But again, I think it's also broadly uh, applicable. So I encourage you to think about how, um, how what, what we talk about is both similar to and different from your own story and the story of other religions and societies. So let's start with, this is annoying, now I have to move back here. All right. I'm all about the PowerPoint. <laughs> so we'll start with stories. And by stories, I mean storytelling. And Judaism has, from its inception, included a great deal of storytelling. In fact, uh, every religion I know about includes a great deal of storytelling. It's a big part of religion. And in this case, I want to talk about origin stories, the stories that the earliest Jews told about what their origins were. Before that, though, uh, we need to take a, a quick geography and history lesson. So where we are in the world when we're talking about the earliest Jews is the Middle East. Can you all see the PowerPoint? Is it a good location? I'm not blocking. Um, and specifically the area that is now uh, Israel-Palestine. And um, we need to go back in time, about 3,000 years. So we're about 1,000 BCE. And here, in this region, there emerges a small kingdom I don't know if you can see that really small part. It's pretty small. <laughs> uh, a small kingdom um, called the Kingdom of Israel. Uh, and the, the uh, Israelites, whose descendants are known as Jews, composed and told and retold stories about 
mythical stories about where they came from, how this kingdom ended up being what it is, uh, and being who they are. Now, it's important to remember when, uh, or to know for the first time, <laughs> that when a society composes stories and tells stories like these about who they are and what their past is and where they come from, they're not just passing down history. They're passing down identity and values. So they're going to make choices about what they stress. In the case of the ancient Israelites, the stories they ended up, um, these stories that they told ended up being the basis of and the anchor for the entire religion known as Judaism. And one of the major themes for their origin stories is, uh, you guessed it, migration. <laughs> um, and not just migration to the kingdom, like, oh, we all came here from someplace else, but migration to the kingdom, from the kingdom, or the, this land that then became the kingdom, and all around inside of it. There's just a lot of stories of migration built into the origins of Israel. Uh, when I say Israel, uh, I don't mean the modern state of Israel. It's the name of the, also the name, not by accident, of the ancient kingdom of Israel, which uh, is the, the antecedent of all of Judaism. Okay. So the question we need to ask is why do, why did and why do Jews focus so much on this theme of migration? And remember, these stories are being composed at a time when uh, the people are all actually together in one place, living in this kingdom and this society together. So the answer I suggest for why uh, migration is so much a part of the origin stories of uh, Judaism is because of migration's intersection with two fundamental themes that I think the Bible and Judaism, and in some ways, all religion is really about. The first one is vulnerability. A migratory people are a people who understand what it means to be vulnerable, what it means to be susceptible to hurt, both um, and, and difficulty, a challenge, physically, socially, linguistically, in terms of the languages they speak, and emotionally. And when the Israelites decided to preserve migration as a major, uh, a major component of the story of who they are, they're building into their religion a sensitivity to vulnerability. And that's important on two levels. First, it gave them, uh, and this is made explicit in the Bible, uh, it gave them a responsibility to be sensitive to others who are suffering and who are migrants. This is said all the time throughout the Bible. You were migrants, be, be loving to the migrants, to strangers, to foreigners. On another level, it also gave them an affirmation of their own innate vulnerability and a kind of a roadmap, ah, uh, get it, for, how, get it, roadmap, <laughs> traveling, uh, for how to deal with, um, with that vulnerability in life and in uh, society. The second fundamental theme that migration touches on um, that intersects with, again, what I think the Bible and Judaism and really all religion is, is so much about is relationships. Relationships with neighbors, new and old, with people who travel with us and whom we meet along the way. A migratory people have to be people who think about, carefully, about how and with whom to form relationships and what those relationships mean. Religion is so much about how we relate to others uh, and how we build relationships as a society. So migration and its attendant themes are innately intertwined with some of the basic goals of religion. And it makes sense, therefore, that the Jews have focused a great deal uh, in their, uh, on their stories about migration. So let's shift now, and I'm gonna, I'm, at the end I'm gonna have questions for you and you can ask questions for me, but if you have something you wanna either clarify or just jump in with a thought, feel free to raise your hand and I'll pause as I go. Um, so, but let's shift, uh, assuming no, questions right now and talk about one of the major causes of migration, uh, which is um, exile. Exile means a group of people being forcibly removed or kicked out from a place. This is theme number two. So um, here we go to the next chapter of Jewish history from the uh, ancient Israelite kingdom um, to the transition from that, that kingdom to a religion known as Judaism. So Okay, as I said before, we have this Israelite kingdom in that spot uh, in the region generally that is now uh, Israel-Palestine, and it, um, it begins 
uh, about 3,000 years ago, about 1,000 BCE, and um, it lasts for about 400 years as a kingdom, as a political entity, as a society. It was during the time of the kingdom that most of, like I said, most of the important stories that ended up uh, in the Hebrew Bible, the Jewish scripture, um, were composed, that became the, the foundation of, of Judaism. The mythical stories about migration that I just talked about um, are set long before the, uh, the period of the kingdom. They're set, uh, projected further into the past. But it's only after the time of the kingdom that we can really talk about the beginning of Judaism as a religion. So we need to look at what that uh, transition is all, uh, is all about and why it gives birth to a religion. And the answer is actually fairly uh, straightforward. It seems like a really <laughs> difficult question, but it's a fairly straightforward uh, uh, issue, and that is uh, destruction and exile led to the birth of Judaism. So the kingdom was destroyed as a result of some regional uh, politics and wars that we don't need to go into, but the upshot is that the political entity that was the kingdom of Israel was dissolved permanently, um, and the, uh, most of the people were kicked out from that land to uh, Babylonia, which is modern day Iraq. And then a truly shocking thing happened, and this makes all the difference. And it's shocking because for some reason or other, um, this didn't happen to any, uh, any other such small kingdom that uh, suffered a fate like uh, Israel at that time and in that region. And there were numerous other such kingdoms. The shocking thing that happened is that instead of dissolving into Babylonian society like everybody else does, like the kingdom of Moab, you don't hear people saying, uh, I'm a I'm Moabite, or you know, ask someone, uh, that's, a, that's an interesting name. What's, what's the background of that name? Nobody says Ammonite, because the Ammonites and the Moabites were crushed also by these empires who they just dissolved into. But what happened to the Israelites when they went into exile? In exile in Babylonia, the Israelites held on to their religious and ethnic identity. Part of that, and accompanied with that, in exile in Babylonia, the Israelites grieved and remembered together that destruction and that exile. These two things are major pieces of establishing Judaism as a religion. And I suggest that it's because of what they represent and what they cultivate. And that is resilience, whoops, resilience and community. Resilience is so much of what religion offers people, a way of uh, dealing with the inevitable challenges of life and continuing on through them, bouncing back from tragedy coping with loss. How many people come to religion specifically at a time of a suffering? And as for community, well, nothing brings a group together like experiencing pain together. The sense of shared burdens, excuse me, shared burdens and shared joys and shared resilience is uh, uh, so much of what religion offers people. And so it makes sense that in the history of Judaism, its foundational moment was in many ways one that reflected and then further cultivated, built on uh, resilience and community. So that resilience and community, in fact, were quite important in maintaining Judaism throughout the Middle Ages as we go forward into, into history. 1,500 years after the original uh, exile from their homeland, Jews were in many ways thriving, we're now in the Middle Ages, Jews are in many ways uh, thriving throughout Europe and the Middle East, but they were also repeatedly being ex expelled en masse from various European countries. And don't worry about the details, I know you can't see the details in here, but you could see just from the hours and the colors, Jews kept being kicked out <laughs> of places in Western Europe. Um, now you might be thinking, wait, um, why didn't you start here? Look at all the migration that the Jews experienced. Uh, well, I didn't start here, but now we're here. So uh, let's talk about the results of all this uh, migration uh, in the Middle Ages. Okay, the thing here says expulsions of the Jews, 1100 to, to 1600. So this is 500 years worth of expulsion. Uh, exile uh, was uh, some, not nearly all, of the cause of medieval Jewish uh, immigration and settlement around Europe. Uh, I just, I just want to point out, it, it, these are migrations and expulsions over the course of 500 years. So if you lived, you know, let's say you live 100 years, um, and you live in France, but not during the century where there was an expulsion, you're doing fine. So any individual moment you and place that you put your, your 
your marker down in the Middle Ages, it wasn't necessarily all grim and, and persecution. Um, just in the large view, there was a lot of moving around and this had, this had major communal uh, consequences. So let's talk about those consequences. Um, uh, in other words, the, the effect of all this migration and that's the third thing I want to talk about, which is ethnicities. So first of all, what is the word ethnicity? Uh, well, uh, you could have a whole other, maybe do, there is a whole other sociology course on that, but on the simplest, simplest level, ethnicity means uh, a shared identity based on being from a certain place. Now you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, isn't Jewish uh, ethnic identity just about being Jewish and being descendants of the people from that kingdom I just talked about? So, well, yes, I'm sure you're all thinking that. Um, uh, so, well, yes, in some ways, that is Jewish ethnic identity. That broad ethnic identity is an important piece, in fact, and we'll come back to this, of the religious community, um, which, like I said, dates back to its earliest formation. But frankly, that was a really long time ago. Uh, and additional layers of ethnic identity were built up on top of that throughout the Middle Ages. Because even though the Jews started out in this fairly small area of land, by uh, uh, over the course of the Middle Ages, they ended up really all over the place. North Africa uh, uh, spread throughout the Middle East, uh, Ethiopia, small communities in India and China, uh, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, Northern Europe. Now. As a friend of mine who's a scholar of medieval history puts it, people uh, have sex with the people around them, sometimes by force, sometimes by choice, sometimes with the consequences, when we're talking about Jews, of inclusion within the Jewish community, and sometimes with the consequences of departure from uh, the Jewish community. But in the end of the day, there is enough mixing with local populations that by the early modern times, so by, let's say, uh, the, the 1700s, you have a broad range of Jewish ethnicities and racial identities. Not only do Ethiopian Jews and Spanish Jews and Romanian Jews and Yemenite Jews not look alike, but their ethnic identity is different. Their culture and their sense of connectedness with other Jews. And this ethnic diversity, which is a direct result of migration, affects a tremendous amount within the religion. So let's go through th some of those kinds of differences that are, that are uh, come along with, or that are part of ethnic diversity. Aesthetic differences. What does a Jew look like? Well, depends where and, and when. Uh, and I'm not just talking about racially, although that's certainly a component, but also styles of hair and clothing, um, art and architecture. Standards for modesty. What does it mean to dress modestly and present oneself? It's going to vary by, by region, by culture. Uh, standards for formal attire and behavior. Right? Um, think about the, you know, what, uh, um, uh, what a wedding looks like in different cultures, the kinds of clothing people wear. Gender roles are part of these differences. Music. And of course, food. Is Jewish food bagel and lox? Or is it shakshuka, or stuffed grape leaves? Yes. So aesthetic differences are really touch everything. Also, intellectual differences. So when Jews were part of a larger Muslim Arabic culture, they participated in that intellectual life, which was very different from the intellectual life of Western Christian uh, Europe, which Jews also participated in there. This affects differences in philosophy, in legal thinking, thinking about the law, uh, what schooling looks like, the standards and structures of communal learning, scribal practices, uh, intellectual, you see combined, intellectual and aesthetic differences, um, that means different kinds of Jewish literature that was produced in different cultural contexts, poetry, philosophy, theater, Comedy. There's also linguistic differences, languages. Now, of course, Jews in different places spoke different languages. The founder of the Hasidic movement, the ultra-Orthodox, um, an ultra-Orthodox movement of Eastern Europe, spoke Russian. The greatest Jewish philosophers of Babylonia and Spain spoke uh, and wrote in Arabic. 
But there were also uniquely Jewish languages uh, and dialects that became profoundly important to the Jewish groups that spoke and even still speak them. Yiddish is the most famous, at least in America. Uh, this language, Yiddish, originated in uh, the Middle Ages as a combination of Hebrew and German and ended up being uh, then moved with those German Jews from the Middle Ages into Eastern Europe and became the dominant Jewish language of all of Eastern Europe. Ladino, not Latino with a T, Ladino with a D, uh, or Judeo-Spanish as it's sometimes called, was a widely spoken hybrid of Old Spanish and Hebrew. Um, it's in significant decline today, but uh, for both of these uh, languages, the Ladino and Yiddish, there are both known and unknown riches of Yiddish and Ladino literature, uh, theater, comedy, music, and communities. And even Judeo-Arabic and Judeo-Persian, which are dialects of, of those languages. These are all products of ethnic difference. And finally, liturgical differences. The liturgy means prayer and prayer practices. Now, see, the interesting thing here is that it becomes clear in this realm of liturgy that uh, the diversity isn't just superficial. It's not just related to things like peripherally religious things like clothing and language. Synagogue life, synagogue is the Jewish house of worship. Uh, worship and prayer services varies both aesthetically and linguistically and intellectually, but varies um, significantly among uh, different Jewish ethnic groups based on their historical experiences and their cultural context. So I'll give you two examples. First, the mechanics of Jewish prayer, the mechanics of prayer services. Most of the Jews in the Middle Ages, um, as uh, prayer especially was developing and diversifying, most of the Jews in the Middle Ages lived in societies that were either majority Muslim or majority Christian. And it's no coincidence that European Jewish services, which were in a, uh, a Christian context, European Jewish services, just like in the churches of their Christian neighbors, include a great deal of silence and private reading. Middle Eastern and North African Jewish prayer services, just like the mosques of their Muslim neighbors, include a great deal of public chanting on the part of a prayer leader. Now, please don't think of that as just aesthetic or superficial. It means that these communities developed different ways of communicating with God that accorded with their own cultural sensibilities. And I'll give you a bit of a deeper example of liturgical differences between Jewish ethnic communities. So the holiest day of the Jewish year is Yom Kippur, or Yom Kippur, the Jewish Day of Atonement. It's a serious day that's observed primarily through fasting, not eating and drinking, and prayer. That's the same throughout all Jewish communities. But the tone of the day, the holiest day of the year, the tone of the day in European Jewish synagogues is strikingly different, strikingly different from the tone of the day in Middle Eastern and North African Jewish communities. And this has to do with the history of those communities and when and why some of its prayers were composed. The German Jewish community in the late 11th and 12th century, so 1096 it starts, the German Jewish community experienced a series of tragedies when uh, Christian uh, crusaders came through uh, major Jewish communities of the Rhineland along the Rhine River and slaughtered countless Jews and destroyed synagogues and Jewish neighborhoods. Now the Jewish community in Germany uh, rebuilt itself and eventually thrived again, but it was a huge trauma. And uh, smaller traumas like that continued to happen for a couple of hundred years uh, as a result of the crusader movement, which was a, a Christian movement to kill uh, the enemies of Christ. So one of the ways in which, how does the Jewish, the German Jewish community respond to this trauma? Uh, the, one of the ways that they did, one of the longest lasting ways is, is with the idea that the dead were martyrs, that they died a holy death. And they expressed this view through the composition of numerous prayers and poems and practices to honor the dead and to emphasize the value of martyrdom in, uh, in Judaism. Many of these prayers were then inserted into the afternoon uh, liturgy of Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the year. And this aspect of Yom Kippur eventually became standard in all Central and uh, Eastern European Yom Kippur liturgies. So as a result, down to today, 
Central and Eastern European Jewish services on Yom Kippur have an air of sadness and somberness, uh, even morbidity sometimes. But in North Africa and Middle Eastern Jewish communities, they had different experiences. And these types of prayers about the dead did not enter into their uh, Yom Kippur service. And down to today, the whole tone of Yom Kippur is different in synagogues that preserve those Jewish groups' liturgies. This past Yom Kippur, I happened to, this past Yom Kippur, I happened to be sitting uh, in my synagogue, which follows a European tradition, next to a friend whose parents are a Jewish friend whose parents are Moroccan and Iraqi, um, and she usually didn't come to this synagogue, so this European liturgy was new to her, and she was beyond surprised by how grim some of the prayers and poems were. In Spanish and Middle Eastern synagogues, Yom Kippur is joyous and celebratory. It's still serious and it's still a fast day, but not in the sad sort of death-oriented way. She, her face was amazing. She kept looking at the prayer book going, we don't, we don't have this. <laughs> um, it's a big difference in the whole tone of the holiest day of the Jewish year. Because of the different ethnic groups and their cultural context and their histories. So Jewish ethnic groups have a, some pretty profound differences in both the style and content of their synagogue experiences. Now, I feel it's important to note, across all of these differences among Jews, a great deal was and is, in fact, um, shared between them. And these are all the elements that predate the migration in the Middle Ages. That includes uh, scripture and ancient texts. There's a whole lot of medieval literature that piles up, but the oldest texts, the, the Hebrew Bible, scripture, and then other layers of ancient texts are shared by all uh, Jewish communities. The ritual and festival calendar, all the many Jewish holidays that you get to miss New York City Public School for, but not anymore. Or that, take my classes in the fall, I miss some classes, but not next fall, because they're on the weekends. Anyway, the festival calendar, when and what all those holidays are, that's all predated the migration, that's shared. There are numbers of other uh, basic shared practices, the dietary laws, not eating pig, things like that. Prayer, though the prayer services look different, three times daily prayer is shared by all these Jewish communities. And the Hebrew language, there's lots of linguistic differences and sort of Languages that uh, adopt a kind, an almost sacred quality, like Yiddish, um, but almost. The real sacred language is Hebrew language. That's the language of scripture, and it's shared and preserved and maintained uh, throughout uh, Jewish history and all the diversity. But um, the significance of migration, not only for the details of what Judaism looks like and what Jews look like, uh, but for what Judaism offers its adherents, uh, the significance of that migration can't really be overstated. And the two basic themes that we can see here are identity and adaptability. And when I say identity, I mean, uh, like I said at the beginning, first of all, a cross-cultural identity, a broad sense of connection and solidarity, specifically with a range of people around the world and throughout history. This Jewish ethnic identity that transcends all of this difference. That sense of family and community is a great deal of what often draws people to religion in the first place. But also, as you know, identity is layered and intersectional. And so the ability to identify and to place oneself in the yet tinier community of, uh, tighter community of ethnically similar Jews, especially as minority culture, the Jews anywhere are a minority culture uh, for almost all Jewish history, uh, is, it, that, that tighter community is likewise meaningful and important as a feature of religious life. It can be, no doubt, a source of tension and even racism uh, within the Jewish community that we're still struggling with today, but it can also be a source of joy and communal uh, community building. And adaptability. The only reason that Judaism survived for 2,500 years, beyond just the resilience that was built into its early history, is that uh, the adaptability to different languages, cultures, and places. And of course, this continues down to the modern period when Jews migrated in large numbers to America and other places. So far, so good. You with me? So speaking of Jews coming to America, <laughs> it's a good picture, right? That was like the first one that came up when I Googled, <laughs> Google Images. Jews in America. That works. OK. Um, so let's shift gears to modern times. Uh, and we can talk about a lot of different kinds of Jewish migration and the effects of Jewish migration in America, on the Jews, on America, whatever. But I want to talk about one particular phenomenon, and that is transplants. 
which is to say communities of Jews who came to America as a group in the 20th century and attempted to simply transplant the world that they inhabited in, in Europe into, well, uh, Brooklyn. <laughs> as the world changed around them, as they literally traveled across the world, they attempted to hold on to the culture and the religious ways that they were familiar with from the old country. And what does that look like? Sorry, what does that look like? Like that, Hasidim in Brooklyn. So this population, which is the most visible uh, Jewish population, this population uh, actually represents a small minority of the Jewish world, so maybe five to 10% of the Jews. Uh, but they are the most, like I said, the most visible Jews, and that's not an accident. It has to do with the circumstances of their immigration to America uh, and their particular religious worldview. So again, free history lesson, let's talk a drop about Jewish immigration to America. It's essentially three waves plus one. Um, Western European Jews, uh, I don't know if you can, the colors might make it difficult to see towards the back. Western European Jews between 1650 and 1850 came to America uh, in fairly small numbers with all, other, with all the other European colonists uh, who came here in the early modern period, followed by in the early 19th century, in the mid-19th century, uh, larger numbers of uh, German Jewish immigrants. So by 1880, after the first two waves, there's about a quarter of a million, 250,000 Jews in America. This population vastly expands uh, from 1880 to 1924 with a huge influx of Eastern European uh, Jews who immigrate to America. Um, over two million Eastern European Jews come to America in that 45-year uh, uh, period or so. Uh, around the 1924, strict immigration quotas get enforced in America, and so um, Jewish immigration, along with a lot of other immigration, is severely curtailed, stalled. Um, most of all of these Jews uh, so far had come to America seeking economic opportunity, uh, adventure, a new life, all the things actually that most immigrants came here for. So, but what's the plus one? I said it's three waves plus one, and that is uh, Holocaust refugees. After the Nazi Holocaust in Europe, uh, World War II, there were still strict immigration quotas in America, but significant enough numbers of Jews came to the United States as refugees. Among those refugees, not all of them, but among those refu refugees were a small but tight-knit group, really I should say a, a, a set of groups known as Hasidim. Hasidim is the plural of, uh, like you say, Hasidic Jews, or if you want to use one word in Hebrew, Hasidim, or Hasids. These are, who are Hasidim? They are ultra-Orthodox Jews. They're fundamentalists uh, in the sense that they reject uh, modernity and secularism, secular values. The Hasidim were and are actually only a slice of the ultra-Orthodox, the fundamentalist Jewish community worldwide, but it's a particularly interesting slice in terms of how migration affected it. So what is Hasidism? Uh, Hasidic Judaism uh, was a movement that began in the 18th century, and it spread in uh, Poland and uh, Russia and Hungary. And when I say Russia, this is at the time of the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union, so these borders are not really useful. But the, the, the three sort of contexts are, are, are Poland, Russia, and Hungary. And it involved several dynasties of uh, rabbis, known as Rebis, to whom their uh, followers were um, particularly important. They were especially, these Rebis were especially revered by their followers, more than other uh, Jewish communal leaders. Uh, this is really distinctive of Hasidic groups. They, have, they, they coalesce around a, a particular spiritual uh, head. When the Hasidim came to America, what was unique as Holocaust refugees, what was unique about their, um, their immigration story, especially in America, as far as Jewish immigration to America, was that they actively pushed against adapting to the American lifestyle. I want to pull out two short, short quotes, actually, from this book uh, uh, by Jerome Mintz. It's from 1992 called Hasidic People, A Place in the New World. He really does a great job of capturing uh, what the issue is here. And he puts it well, so I'm just going to pull out his quotes. The growth of the New York Hasidic community began following the Second World War with the arrival of the survivors of the Nazi Holocaust. This remnant of the once populous Hasidic communities of Eastern and Central Europe 
came to America with a greater sense of social continuity than had earlier immigrants. They came not as individuals seeking jobs, wealth, or adventure, but rather as refugees struggling to restore their communities. And he says the shared mission of Hasidic Jewry in New York City was to recreate the world that had existed in pre-war Europe. Unlike the immigrants of earlier decades who had sought to eliminate differences between themselves and other Americans and to integrate into American life, these new Hasidic arrivals went to extraordinary pains to protect their identity as ultra-Orthodox Jews. Distinctiveness from the American community, rather than acculturation, was the keystone of their social strategy. So they're focused on continuity, recreating the old community, and distinctiveness from their present society. And this results in large groups of Jews, especially in Brooklyn, again, who look like this. I hope you can see this slide, because we're going to look a little bit closely at that. They don't look like they fit in New York City, uh, but that's exactly the point. In transplanting their community from one place to another, which happened because of a relatively sudden and concentrated migration, which was the result of a catastrophe, they established themselves proudly as misfits. There's a word that's often thrown around, especially with Judaism, to describe adhering to these old ways rather than adapting uh, or acculturating, and that is tradition. <laughs> If you don't know what that's a picture of, speak to me after. Uh, now, here's the thing. There's a great irony involved in this, uh, what is considered tradition. Now, I'm going to show that with one example of the old ways that they preserve. One of the very important things to them about what they preserve uh, is their distinctive dress. And this varies among different Hasidic groups. So notice the differences, if you can, these are three different Hasidic groups, uh, different hats and different coats, even different ways of buttoning up their coats. Different lengths of coats, different colors of coats. Well, these are, should be black. They're mostly all black and white. Um, so how did it come to be that different Hasidic groups, remember they're small groups that each coalesce around a particular uh, rabbi. Um, how did it come to be that Hasidic groups dress differently? It's because Hungarian Hasidim dressed like 19th century Hungarians, and Russian Hasidim dressed like 19th century Russians. And same with the uh, Poles and the subgroups within them. They have the styles that match the cultural context, the broader cultural context that they originated in. There are Hungarian styles of food and language, accents, uh, decorations in the home, and likewise Russian and Polish. Much of the distinctiveness that's so important to the Hasidic community in New York, distinctiveness as a religious value, not just a nostalgic throwback, but like to be a good Hasid is to dress like a good Hasid. Much of that, uh, that distinctiveness was actually a product of the pre-migration community's indistinctiveness, their participation in their cultural context. So what makes them so distinctly Jewish here in New York made them fit back in Hungary and Russia and Poland. If they really wanted to be traditional, to do what their ancestors did, they would trade in their old world clothing for modern American clothing. But Hasidic Jews take very seriously, I don't know what my next slide is, Hasidic Jews take very seriously the importance of preserving this tradition. But in fact, and in fact, not only that, many modernist liberal Jews look to Hasidim as preserving uh, the traditions of old in a laudable way, in an admirable way. They often look to the Hasidim and pay liberal Jews, pay far more respect to them than they would any other group whose tenets are actually so opposed to the modernism and the liberalism they hold dear. They take this tradition very seriously, this tradition of distinctiveness. But from a historical perspective, though, we should really call it tradition with quotes. Again, what it represents here in Brooklyn might seem like the old venerated distinctiveness of the Hasidic Jews of Europe, when in actuality it's a reflection of the European Hasidim's participation in European culture. And the distinctiveness is the result of the sudden upheaval and the population transplant. That's why it looks distinctive. Now, I'm not actually saying this to uh, dismiss it, um, although a little bit. Um, 
I'm not really saying this to dismiss it entirely because as much as on a personal level, and I will add that on a personal level, I tend to be appalled by the great mystique around these fundamentalist Jews who are, as I said, maybe five to 10% of the Jewish population. The reason that this mystique exists is something very real that they uh, produce, which is a sense of authenticity. Not necessarily actual authenticity, but a sense of authenticity. Life is hard. Life is full of artifice. People often crave a sense of being part of something authentic, part of something that connects them with something more true or more real, or some time more true or more real than the reality we're living in now. The idea of an old country and its ways provides that for many people, even generations after the migration. In fact, sometimes more so generations later. Another aspect of this same uh, idea is the need for continuity with the past. especially after a tragic break from a community's life, as happened as a result of the uh, Nazi Holocaust in Europe. But transplanted communities and the adamant preservation of the trappings of the pre-migration life allow people to bridge the chasm between the past and the present. I mean, well, I did that wrong. The present and the past. <laughs> a sense of continuity happens on its own when people stay in the same place. I have a friend in my town, I live in Hoboken, New Jersey. It's a city that's one square mile in size. So I have a friend in town whose family has been in the town for uh, three generations. Her children are the fourth generation. Her grandparents helped build the largest church in town. Uh, they worked for the local hospital. Her mother and her father, uh, well, one of them, was born and bred in Hoboken, and so is she. And now she's raising her kids there. So we were sitting in one of the large parks in Hoboken that, uh, that's beside the church her grandparents helped build. And we were talking about all the ghosts of her family's life that are all over this town. And she said it's very comforting and sweet. This is not a person who resists change to superficial things. The town has changed a great deal over the past couple of decades. Because her sense of rootedness and connection to the past runs very deep in this place. And there have been, like I said, countless changes already over the generations. She has no illusion of extreme stability because she has actual stability. But when people are ripped away from a place, they often develop a need to preserve it just as it was. And we can relate to this without having to imagine uh, or recall great tragedy. I found pictures online of my uh, childhood home uh, that was up for sale. So my family hasn't lived there in decades, but I lived there till I was 17 years old. And I was appalled, aghast, in fact, that the pictures that were posted online, all the furniture was in the wrong place. They set it up completely wrong. They, they got the house all wrong. Also, it's really not good realtor pictures, but what's the reason? Because I had that house frozen in my mind in 1997, exactly as it was. And they had the gall to change it. So whether it's a childhood home or a neighborhood church or a particular hat or silk coat, we tend to have a need for things from the past that are gone, that we can't get to anymore, to remain present for us and to remain frozen in time. Religion in general is a source for many people of authenticity, of, like I said, something more true or more real than is ordinarily tangible. And continuity with the innumerable generations before us who have read the same holy texts and practiced the same rituals is a huge part of what religion offers people. Migration can play a really significant role in what we view as the past, what we view as authentic, and how we end up holding on to it and connecting to it. So these are the four aspects of uh, migration that intersect dramatically with religion. I tried to pull out these various themes, vulnerability, relationships, community, resilience, identity, adaptability, authenticity, and continuity that are so significant in migration and in religion through <coughs> examples in Jewish history. Now, I want, of course, to open it up for questions you can ask me in the last little bit, uh, but I also want to start by, uh, you've all been very quiet, but get ready. I want to ask you about what resonates here for you with other migration issues that you've learned about um, or that you know about. And well, I think it's always great to learn about a specific uh, large minority community in New York City, uh, which, like the Jews. The Jews are, in fact, the largest religious minority in the United States. I think it's even more important that when we learn about um, different groups, that we're able to draw lines of connection 
to see both commonality and differences that can each be honored. So uh, you tell me, what resonates uh, or contrasts with uh, other religions or other migration stories that you know about? And then, of course, or mixed in with that, you can ask me questions about what I said. So, um, What's your name? Sarah. Sarah. Mm-hmm. Sorry to listen to the comment. Um, so I'm a Spaniard, and I have come from this place in Spain called Galicia. And so I know that that group, like I have, um, I work in the social club that basically used to be a Russian Orthodox church. So um, it's actually very interesting. They have like a restaurant, like social group events. And I know that a lot of immigrants came there because like they didn't have like a group that they felt like they could, you know, identify with like a sense of community basically. And to this day it's still there and it's been there since like nineteen thirty something. So yeah. So that's I just immediately, you know, put two and two together there. Yeah, it's very similar. I, I think uh, uh, a lot of different groups have that um, that story in America of sort of coming and um, sort of mixing in, but then realizing something's missing yeah. and connecting with that pre-migration group. That that sense of rootedness is, mm-hmm. is meaningful to to a lot of different groups, a lot of people. So I oh, just want to add one more thing. Sure. So there was a woman who came in saying that she went to the church. And she was like shocked that everything was so different, kind of like how your story with the house. <laughs> and she was just um, laughing and sharing stories with everyone. And it's just funny and sweet that it's like two different cultures and they're just like, you know, sharing a place that was once hers, you know? She showed us pictures and everything that was really nice. Oh, absolutely. Great. What's your name? Jacqueline. Jacqueline? The idea of transplants uh, resonated with me because I have uh, grandparents that uh, they're born in Ecuador and then they like come here on visa, so occasionally they come here to, to the U.S. But they have trouble like assimilating and like leaving behind their culture because they grew up in like the farm life in the mountains. Mm-hmm. So like the way they dress, like we'll go to like Manhattan and they'll be dressed in their traditional uh, wear and like it's kind of like. Uh, it gives me anxiety sometimes because of the way that, like, the tension of the way people are against people who don't assimilate mm-hmm. to American culture. Sometimes they like like to label them or get like give them like a stereotype or sure. something. But yeah, that resonated with me the way um, my grandparents don't like to assimilate. To American culture. Yeah, and it's interesting that, that you mentioned the way in which you know these are your. Uh, your grandparents, so in the same family with the same heritage, mm-hmm. um, how that that sort of misfit or the mm-hmm. that transplant, that migration can um, mean something really different to different players, different people in that, that very same community. Absolutely. Any other thoughts? Any questions for me? Um, have you done like any personal travels to like help your uh, wh- uh, yes and no. So my, my research, like when I publish books and articles on, is not on this topic specifically. Um, but in terms of like awareness of this, so I've lived in uh, New York, New Jersey, and Jerusalem. Those are the only places I've lived. And visited um, uh, a whole bunch of other countries. And when I tend to visit other countries, I go to their synagogue. So surprising things, I mean simple things tend to be surprising. So. Um, Growing up in America, I, I went to synagogue my whole life, and so prayer books are always have Hebrew and English. So each page has Hebrew and English, Hebrew on one side and English on on the other side. And then I went to France, and we went to a synagogue, and it was Hebrew and French. And I thought that's so funny. It never occurred to me that in different places in the world, the other language would be different. And I have a, a, um, a my grandparents are German, and I have a, a German uh, a prayer book that has Hebrew and German, and the transliteration is different because you pronounce letters differently in, in Hebrew and, uh, sorry, in English and in, in German. Um, and so the, from the time when I was very young, being aware of those sorts of sort of shifts and things like sitting next to a friend in synagogue who goes, what are you, why is this so deathy on Yom Kippur today? Uh, in, in my synagogue, it's never like that. And having been to other, there are a lot of uh, Eastern, um, like North African, Middle Eastern uh, based synagogues in Israel. Um, and so I've been to those, and it's, it's really different they, from what I'm used to growing up here, where uh, synagogue, well, I can't say synagogue is like church, because there's lots of different kinds of churches nowadays, but 
synagogue is like early modern church. <laughs> um, uh, so I've seen these other, the, the, the allowed chanting that's very, um, uh, very similar to other religious groups in the, um, in the Middle East. Seeing that firsthand um, has helped me to, to, yeah, put in uh, real tangible perspective of all these things. I think we're about at time yes. and pizza. Oh, well, actually, the best transplant still in, in New York City is Brighton Beach. Actually, if oh, you yeah. want to immerse in Soviet culture, believe me, you won't find, even in the former Soviet Union, you won't find a place more Soviet than Brighton Beach. <laughs> so good. They're more Russian than Russia. <laughs> exactly. It's more Soviet. It's, it's mm -hmm. like, you know, frozen reality, those tours. Uh, food, restaurants, guys, while well, still there, it's amazing. You want to get a sense of the former Soviet Union? Go to Brighton Beach. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Levens. Uh, it was very, very interesting, uh, extremely informative, fascinating, and I'm sure some of our students will definitely mm -hmm. enroll on, uh, in your classes next you semester. Uh, yes, and if you're interested in PowerPoints, by the way, guys, you have to write the final paper, and this is a very There's good a idea. Yeah, you have to write a paper. John will talk about that. John, okay. So, but this is a great idea. This is, and uh, PowerPoints will be available to you. You know, my PowerPoints are not available. You have to read the textbook. <laughs> well, Dr. Lavins is generous enough to share her PowerPoint. So, guys. Uh, let's uh, thank Dr. Lovins for such a fascinating lecture.